Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cisco Community Live event. Today, we're going to talk about understanding how Multicast works with Cisco Wireless LAN Controller. My name is Hilda Artiaga, and I am a Community Manager of the Cisco Community and the host of today's event. Before we start, I would like to let you know more about the Cisco Community. The Cisco Community is an online forum with over half a million members where you can get answers to your technical questions prior to opening cases with attack. You can answer many questions or contribute and write documents, videos, and blogs, such as verify them and get information about that. So before we start, there are a couple of events that I would like to share with you and some activities within the Cisco community. First of all, we're going to have a forum event now called Ask Me Anything. After this event, what is that about? So on this forum session, you will be able to ask all the questions related to this topic. So Stephanie and Chelsea, which are the experts on this event, will be answering to all your questions even after this event has place. So let's say that you have a question maybe one hour, two hours, or three days after this event happened. You just can post them in this forum and we will be answering them. Or on the other side, let's say that we were not able to provide an answer to your question during this live session, maybe because we have to validate information or because we have too many questions, you will be able to find the question just right there. So the links to access to this session indicate that if you want to post a question just right now, because you can do that at the moment, we will place all the information on the chat so you can access to this event and other ones that I'm mentioning. So also we would like to invite you to participate to this special Ask Me Anything event. This is about how to migrate existing networks to Cisco ACI, that is Cisco Application Centric Infrastructure. This is going to have place till Friday, November the 22nd, and it's <clears throat> the extra answer in all your question is to an ingredient. So if you are willing to move into this new data center model, we highly recommend you to join this event. So the details to access to this session and make your questions are just in the chat as well. Also, uh, we have a special event. Uh, if we have a Spanish speakers among the audience, well, uh, we would like to invite you to this uh, session. It is about all the changes that are having place on the Cisco certification. So they will be explaining why they are changing and which are the alternatives and possibilities and what is new and the best recommendations. So this will have place on um, this Thursday, November 21st, with Jose Pablo Esquivel. So the link to access to this event is available on the chat as well. And also, we would like to invite you to become an event top contributor. That is, uh, keep uh, contributing to the community, keep rating, uh, helping people to answer, and you can become someone renewed. We recognize people who participate every month and also for all who participate the whole year till they become a Cisco designated VIP. Another thing that we like to do is please help us to recognize the quality content in the community. So what do we mean? Sometimes you make a question and someone gives you an answer, uh, and the way to say thank you is by giving a helpful vote. Uh, to give a helpful vote is very easy. You just have to click on the start that is just right there on the forum. And also, if someone gives you a right answer and it solves your issue, please give it an accepted solution. That encourages more participation and it helps us to identify things that have good answers or correct answers as well. And well, just to start, uh, what I would like to do is just introduce you to the expert that we have today. Ladies first, so I will start with Stefania Pacheco. She is a technical consulting engineer on the wireless team at the Customer Experience Center. She provides top-level technical support for worldwide customers using Cisco wireless products. Previously, she worked as a network engineer with Cisco Advanced Services, where she solved issues to customers, challenges, compatibility, and she reviewed network designs. Stefania holds a bachelor's degree in telecommunications engineering from the University, uh, National University of Mexico, and she holds a CCMP routing and switching certification. Uh, Stefania, welcome to this event, and thank you so much for joining today. Okay, hello, everyone. Thank you. No oh, problem. And well, uh, on the other hand, we have uh, Josbo, Josbo Bedeska. He currently works as a customer success specialist focus on the enterprise networks, Cisco DNA Center, and SDA Access. Before um, this current position, he worked as a Cisco support engineer for the wireless team at Cisco Technical Assistance Center in Mexico. 
uh, that was for two years. And prior to joining Cisco, he worked for two years with a Cisco Gold partner in Venezuela, implementing and supporting solutions in the routing and switching and security area. Just holds a bachelor's degree in telecommunications engineering from the university, well, I'm going to say this one, Universidad Católica Andres Vero from Caracas, Venezuela, and he holds two CCIE certifications, one in wireless and one in routing and switching. Uh, welcome to this session, Jasper. Thank you so much for making this happen today. You in there? All right. So, well, for all of you who want to have a deeper look on everything that they are going to present today, you can check it out in the community. You will find the link just in the chat so that you can follow up or review. And if you haven't been with us before, um, what I would like to let you know is you can submit all of your questions at the Q&A panel. That is usually located if you are on a desktop on the right side of the menu from WebEx or if you're in, in a mobile, uh, on a mobile device, it's just right on the top. So please, we encourage you that you place your questions there so we can help you answering them. And please use the chat for any suggestion, any comment, or if you have logistic issues, like for instance, I have no audio, my screen freeze, or anything related to that. And well, just to start, uh, and I will pass just the microphone and the ball to Joshua. So please uh, share everything you have for us today. And welcome, everyone. Thank you, Ila. Thank you very much. So I would like to start just by quickly covering the agenda. Uh, you should be able to see the agenda now. We'll be talking briefly about IGMP and PIM. Uh, I will just go over go over these concepts to give you and an, just the, the, the basics that you need to really understand how they play into uh, multicast when we're dealing with wireless LAN controllers. Then we'll obviously cover how multicast works or, or how is it configured on the WLC. And based on, on, on some field experience and in many cases that we've worked through during our experience on, on TAC, we'll cover some common scenarios and going step by step on what happens when we enable multicast, when a client requests multicast uh, traffic and, and, and some of the known issues that you may see on, on the field when, or you may have experience when deploying multicast. And at the end, uh, Stephanie will, will guide you through a demo, uh, applying uh, most of the concepts we'll be covering during the session. During the session, we'll have a few polling questions. This is the first one of them. So we would like to love your feedback here. We would, would we like to understand if you know the difference between PIM dense mode and PIM sparse mode. It's a simple yes or no question. You should get a, a, a polling on the, on the WebEx application. Please feel free to answer the question there. So I will get started talking about IDMP and PIM. And, and it's important to understand what is, what's the difference between them. And, and the, main, the main way of, of looking at them, is because they are both protocols that will help on, how, on control how multicast traffic is distributed or is forwarded on the network, it's the IGMP will control how the multicast traffic is forwarded within a layer two domain, within a layer two broadcast domain. Whereas PIM will control how the multicast traffic is forwarded between different subnets between different networks. So you could basically say that IGMP will be mostly used for layer two and PIM for layer three, right? They have a different type of messages. Uh, on IGMP, you will say uh, membership reports, you will see explicit leads, but those messages have a meaning uh, which you can relate to these messages. For example, IGMP, you, can, you will have some types of, of specific messages that will say, will ask for specific uh, multicast traffic or for a client to explain or, or, or express that they don't no longer need that traffic. You will also have a, a device querying all the other devices in the subnet asking if there is someone interested on a specific group. So those messages, uh, that, that's what IGMP controls. Whereas with PIM, when we talk about dense mode mainly, uh, we'll have two, two main messages, which basically means you have someone who is interested on in the traffic or you don't, you don't no longer have uh, anyone that's interested on the, on the traffic. So we'll talk about IGMP first. And IGMP snooping is, is a feature that is enabled by default on, on Cisco switches. Without it, multicast is just like a broadcast, meaning if you send a multicast packet and broadcast and IGMP snooping is disabled, that packet will be sent over all ports except the port that it was received from. So why is this important? Because IGMP snooping is what makes the multicast not behave as a broadcast and be more efficient. 
So remember those three messages we talked about on the previous slide? This is how they are actually called. So when, when a, a device or an, an endpoint is interested in hearing or listening, receiving some multicast traffic, it will send an IGMP membership report for that specific group. IGMP membership report is also known as IGMP join. So you will hear me uh, during the presentation interchanging those, those using those both terms uh, uh, anytime. The real and, and valid name is membership report, but you know I'm so used to say IGMP join that, <laughs> that it may go out sometimes. Uh, and uh, also you will find some information or some documentation in, out in the internet, some examples where you will read about IGMP join. They're basically talking about membership report. That message means I'm interest, interested on in receiving that traffic, okay? And that message is usually sent by the application or the endpoint that, that, requ that requires to receive the traffic. There is another message, which is the IGMP explicit lib, and this is when you no longer want to receive the traffic. And there is one extra message, and this is talking about IGMP version two mainly, is anyone needs the traffic and this is what the switches or routers on the, on the layer two segment use to know if they need to keep sending the multicast traffic because not all the clients will send an explicit lib. okay so just to give you an example of igmp snooping let's say we have this server sending some video stream to that multicast address by default this switch will drop all those frames because no one has asked for that group with igmp snooping enabled when Let's say we start an application on, 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 this, on this machine that wants to listen that video stream, maybe VLC application can be an example. Then the, the computer will send an IGMP join for that specific group. The switch will realize that now on that specific port, there is someone who is interested on in the group, and then we'll start forwarding the multicast traffic of that video stream to that specific port. Keep in mind that the other computer will not receive this multicast traffic on, unless it explicitly asks for the traffic. And that's because IGMP snooping is enabled. When the application is closed or, or, or the, no longer wants to receive the multicast traffic, the computer will send an IGMP leave for that specific group, and then the switch will stop forwarding the multicast traffic. That's how IGMP controls the forwarding of the multicast traffic on a Ledger 2 domain. There is one, one a scenario where you need to be aware of when there are multiple switches. Let's say this computer wants to join a multicast stream that is gonna be sent by the server on the switch that is on the left side. If you have more than one switch, you may run into a, a condition where the IGMP join will not be forwarded to the upstream switches. And, and that's because the switch does not know the, which, which, one, which ports are the, are, are the upstream ports. So when this happens, the solution is to enable either PIM on one of the interfaces on, the, on that VLAN, or configure a device which will be configured as an IGMP snooping querier. What this means is that device is the one who will be in charge of sending the IGMP membership query, asking everyone if they're still interested on any of the groups. So when we receive, or when a switch receives, uh, that, that query, that membership query, or a PIM hellos, when you enable PIM on the interfaces, it will, be, it will tag those ports as an end router ports. You can see the end router ports as the uplinks for the switch, so ours, the gateway that will take a multicast traffic outside of the network, okay? So in this case, the IGMP join will be always forwarded through the end router ports. And this way, the old switches in the network will know that there is an endpoint that requires or that is interested on in that traffic and the multicast traffic will flow through the network. So I've seen cases where we have controllers and access points on the same villain and, and the traffic is not going through and it's because we have multiple switches and it doesn't get resolved until we enable IG, IP AGMP snooping query or we enable PIM on that, on that villain. Okay. So this is IGMP. Now let's move to PIM. When we talk about PIM, remember, PIM is for Ledger 3 uh, multicast communication, meaning multicast forwarding between different subnets. Okay, so when we talk about PIM, there are neighborships that are performed, that are built, and, and there are two main messages uh, that we can relate to, to PIM, which is the PIM join and PIM, PIM prune. Okay, the PIM join is basically I need some, I have a, someone who is interested in a specific group and the prune will be when no one, uh, you don't have any, any clients interested on that traffic. 
Okay, those traffics are th those packets are based on on dense mode, uh, which is one of the pin modes. So we'll we'll uh, briefly cover dense mode. And dense mode is the easiest way of deploying uh, for deploying multicast. It's uh, very straightforward, uh, but it's not efficient at all. So it, it's based on the logic of flute and prune. Uh, so it's easy to deploy. It's it's good for sm small networks because it, it, you know if, if you have a small environment with where there is no heavy loads of multicast traffic, it will be just fine. But it's not optimal, so it's not recommended at all for large deployments, and you have to be careful because the way dense mode works is every every few minutes. It will st it will flood all the multicast traffic that routers are receiving through all the interfaces, and then the the, the routers will start sending uh, pin prunes saying, "Hey, I don't have no, anyone interested on in this traffic." All the way to the to the source to all the neighbors. So basically, every few minutes you will have a, a flooding of multicast traffic on the network. That's why it's not recommended. It's not optimal. When you have sparse mode which is the recommended mode for, for uh, large deployments, it requires a little bit of design because you need to select a rendezvous point and then you need to, to be careful on, on, on some routing con uh, conditions that you may run into for re reverse path forwarding or RPF when designing rendezvous points in, in sparse mode. So the, the, the thing with sparse mode is that the, the clients or the, the routers will ask to the rendezvous point when they, they want to receive some traffic, they will register on the, on the rendezvous point. And the rendezvous point also when, when you have some clients that are sending traffic. So it's like the control point for the network. So it's more efficient and you don't, you're not sending traffic that is not uh, required in the network when you have a, a sparse mode. There is one more mode, which is not really a, a ping mode, but more like a, a combination of both. It's called sparse dense mode. And what this does is if there is a, a rendezvous point, we will use sparse mode. But if there is no rendezvous point, we will use dense mode. Okay, that's the main difference between them. So let's take a pass and then go for the second uh, polling question. So are you using multicast on your wireless network? Yes or no? And I don't know if we have the results of the first uh, polling, uh, Ilda. Oh, hi, Jaswell. Yes, before I display the first polling question, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you the results for you and the audience. You might see them on the right side at the bottom of the screen, right bottom side. So, or you on your screen, can you see them, Jaswell? Yeah, I can see them now. So, there is a, there's a, 35% of, of the audience knows the difference, 27% did not, and I say did not because I hope with the previous slides uh, I was able to clarify that. And we had another 30% of the audience who didn't participate, so a very even uh, result. Uh, I encourage the ones who did not participate to answer or, or, or take part of the, of the polling question that should be, should be now out. Are you using multicast on your wireless network, yes or no? Perfect. If you have any questions related to what we just talked about, PIM or IGMP, feel free to add them to the Q&A uh, panel. So we now know the basics about IGMP and PIM. That was a very high level overview, but now let's let's deep dive on, on multicast on, on wireless line controllers, okay? So when we talk about multicast and wireless line controller, uh, WLC does not do, do PIM, he does IGMP, okay? And the configuration is extremely straightforward. This is screenshot is from an AOS controller, but on the uh, new 9800 series controller, the configuration is exactly the same. So you, you enable multicast globally, okay? And then you have to select a multicast mode, either multicast unicast or multicast multicast, okay? That's basically it. If you're a wireless uh, engineer, and then someone asks you to configure multicast or enable multicast in the controller, these are the configurations you have to look at at the controller. So it seems to be pretty simple, but then why do we get all these all these cases or all these issues and, and you know no one likes multicast? Why doesn't it work out of the box? And the reason the main reason we find out is that we don't really know the requirements, what's happening under the hood when we configure or we enable this feature. So that's what we will cover in the next few slides. So let's talk about those two modes, right? We have multicast unicast and multicast multicast. So when we talk about multicast unicast, 
Let's say we have a server sending some multicast traffic that the clients need to receive. What the controller will do is it will create a copy of that traffic, okay, and will add the cap web header using the source IP address of the controller management interface and will send and the destination will be the access point IP address. So what happens is if you have one AP, it will send one copy for that access point. If you have two APs, it will send one copy for each of those access points. If you have three, it will, it will generate a copy for each of your access points. So if you have, let's say, uh, 1,000 access points, for each multicast packet that the controller receives, it needs to create 1,000 copies and send them to all the APs. Okay, so you can see multicast unicast does not scale, and it's actually, I believe it's not supported on 8540s and 5520s. Okay, uh, so if you have more than 50 APs, there is a very high chance that you will overload the controller when you use multicast unicast. It works, it doesn't require anything else, but uh, it's basically not, uh, it doesn't scale. So then we decided why don't we use multicast uh, to carry the original multicast traffic, right? So what, what we do is we configure this multicast uh, address on the controller, 239.1.1.1 as an example uh, in this case. And what the controller will do is for every multicast packet that it receives, it will create one single copy and will use its management interface as a source and the destination will be that new multicast address that you configure here. All the access points will send IGMP join or membership request, membership reports to, to the IP address that you configure here. So the access points will receive this packet. And then with one copy, you can get that packet to all thousand APs and then the APs just remove the cap of header and send the original packet to the clients. Okay, so multicast multicast is the recommended mode and, and it's basically the only way nowadays to deploy multicast on a wireless LAN controller. But then again, if it's just that IP address, why it is so complex, right? And, and the reason behind that is that is the APs will join that multicast group that you configure. So you need to ensure that the multicast traffic can flow between the WLC management VLAN, management interface, and the access points management interface. So if the APs and the controller are on the same VLAN, that's no problem because they will work, right? Remember, and those stars are because remember the scenario where we had two switches, just make sure you have an IP IGMP snooping query or you have PIM on one of the interfaces just to be able to get some end route reports on the network, okay? So to make sure that multicast traffic will flow across the whole, the whole layer to domain. However, if they are on different VLANs, then you will require PIM on the wired network, right? Because now you need to carry that, that multicast from the controller management all the way to the access points. Because the destination address is not the access points, it's this multicast group that the access points uh, are listening to. So we'll cover in detail some common, common scenarios on, on based on the experience that we had in TAC on how this works under the hood. What happens step by step since the client, since you enable multicast on the controller and the client starts sending some traffic, how does it look? Okay, so let's take a look at this topology. Okay, it, what I'm trying to, to, to do here is, is trying to replicate one of the common scenarios we have. The customers usually have a core switch, okay? And the controller is usually connected to that core switch uh, using a trunk allowing the SSIDs, the VLANs, and the, uh, the controller management VLAN, okay? Sometimes on this core switch, you can have an SVI that will be the gateway for some APs, okay? So this is the brown or VLAN 30, it's, it's a layer two link. And you may have another building, okay? For that also has some access points, okay? Even though this is VLAN 30, this is a different, different IP address, right? It's a different layer three domain. So, We'll take a look at, the, at this example as a, as, a, as a common scenario. All the examples I'll talk about here are local mode or central switching SSIDs, okay? For FlexConnect, the WLC does not participate or takes part on the multicast for wiring. Everything is done on the wired side. So all the concepts that you will see here about PIM and IGMP also apply for FlexConnect but it's just that the controller does not take part on the multicast for wiring. Therefore, it's all responsibility of the wired network to carry that multicast traffic. So again, 
the examples here will be local mode or central switching SSHs. So let's say we have this server on the top of the screen, VLAN 60, sending traffic to, to that 239.60.60.60. An example of this traffic could be, uh, let's say, the music on hold uh, for, for IP phones when they're on a, on a call, or maybe if you have these, these badges that, that send a, a, that work as a walkie-talkie, then you, 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 you may be sending some messages to them, for example. That can be some of the application. So, what will happen is, let's say we have one of these phones that it just was put on hold, uh, then it will send an IGMP join for that music on hold traffic, right? So it will send an IGMP join for the 239-60-60-60 group, which is the traffic that is sending, that the server is sending. So that client will send that IGMP join over the air to the access point. The access point will grab that frame and we'll put it in CabWeb and we'll send it to the controller. And this is a Unicas packet. The access, the access points always send the traffic in CabWeb Unicas to the controller, meaning the source is the access point management villain, the destination is the controller management villain. The access points do not source the traffic or do not add that CabWeb header with a multicast address as a destination. Only the controller does that. So the, the access point encapsulates that packet, send it over to the controller. The controller has IGMP Snoopil enabled. Now it realizes we have someone on VLAN 60 who needs traffic for that group. So the controller will send the IGMP join over the trunk on its VLAN 60 to be able to start receiving the multicast traffic in, that it needs to forward to the client. Okay. Now the switch also has IGMP snooping. So the switch says, okay, I have someone on the interface GIG01, which is my port towards my controller on VLAN 60 that needs this traffic. Then the switch, because it, it was receiving traffic from the server, which is directly connected, it starts forwarding the traffic towards the controller in the trunk using the VLAN 60. Now what? What will happen, right? This is where our configurations will take place. If you enable multicast and you enable multicast unicast, then no problem. You have only two APs. It will work, okay, if you're allowed to enable it. Uh, but if you have more than 50 APs, you may overload the controller. And as I said, it's not supported on the latest platforms. So we have no option. We need to go with multicast, multicast. So now we need to ensure that we can carry the multicast traffic between the controller management interface and the access points management villain. Okay, so now we have the traffic getting, the multicast traffic hitting the controller. But now the controller needs to send it towards the AP. Okay, so we need to ensure the APs receive that traffic. So how, how do we do it? In this case, we have this core switch. And the core switch, you need to enable multicast routing globally. And I'm gonna use sparse dense mode here. Okay, because I don't have a rendezvous point, this basically is enabling uh, IP PIM dense mode on those interfaces. If you take a look at the interfaces, I'm talking about the controller management villain and the access points management villain that are directly connected on that core switch. Okay, so ha, ha, what, ha, what's the effect of this? Uh, how does this work in the background? So when I enable multicast on the controller, the access point send in an IEMP join on its management IP to that IP, to that multicast group that you configure on the controller. Then the switch, the core switch, receive that multicast, uh, that uh, IGMP membership report. And then because it has a GMP snooping, it, it knows that it has someone on VLAN 30, which is the access point VLAN, that needs traffic for that group. Okay? So if that switch receives traffic on VLAN 30 for that group, it will forward it over to the downstream switch. Okay, so the controller will start sending that traffic encapsulated on the management VLAN. Okay, so remember when I told you about the source IP address will be the controller management and the destination will be the multicast IP that you configure on the WLC. The controller is encapsulating the original multicast packet with that header on top of it and sending it over the management interface. Now, this is where PIM does its part, right? Because on the core switch, we also have PIM enabled. On, on, on those villains. So the switch is receiving that traffic on VLAN 20. Then do we have ping on VLAN 20? Yeah, we have it. We, we enable ping on the WLC management interface, right? So the switch will ask itself at this point, does someone else need this traffic on VLAN 20? Because it's running IGMP, so it needs to know if someone else on that layer two domain needs that traffic. In this case, no. Or is there anyone on any other VLAN or subnet that requires that traffic? 
And then, yes, on VLAN 30, we need the traffic. But how does the switch know that? Because remember, the access point sent the IGMP join, and the, the IGMP join got to the switch on the VLAN 30, which also has PIM enabled. Okay? So in this case, they, the, the controller is sending the multicast traffic. The switch will send the multicast packet towards the downstream switch. The downstream switch has the, you know, on its IGMP snooping table says, I have an access point connected on, on a specific port who is requesting that traffic. And then the, the packet gets to the AP. The AP will remove the cap up header and the original multicast packet is delivered to the client. Okay? So that would be a scenario number one. If you have any questions about that specific scenario, please, when you ask the question on the Q&A panel, say, specify that it is for a, a scenario number one. So, so we know, you know which, which specific workflow you're talking about. Now I'm gonna give you another, another example, another scenario, which would be a little bit more complex and again, if, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them uh, on the Q&A panel. Please specify if you're asking about the scenario number one or scenario number, number two, if it's a, a scenario specific question. So in this second scenario, we'll talk about having the multicast source as a server on the remote side. And we'll also involve the remote, uh, the remote side AP. So it's it's basically the same thing. Let's go over the process. But in this time, in, the, in this time, the clients on VLAN 50 and VLAN 70 are going to request the multicast traffic. Okay. So the first step is we enable multicast on the controller, right? So the access points will send an IGMP join via via its management VLAN, and that that way the switches will will know that if they receive multicast traffic for that specific IP or that specific group, they need to send it to the APs on those ports. Now, because the APs are not in the same VLAN than the WLC management, we need to enable PIM to be able to carry traffic from the multicast, uh, from the management interface of the controller to the access points management interface. So how do we do it again? We go to the core switch, and on the core switch, we will enable multicast uh, globally, and then on VLAN 20 and VLAN 30, meaning the controller management VLAN and the access points management VLAN. Now we'll go to the remote side uh, switch and we'll enable multicast routing globally and we'll enable PIM also on that on the access point VLAN. Now, what's the problem here, right? What's the issue here? And the issue is that we need to make sure that the multicast traffic is carried from the controller management to the access point management, meaning we will, for the local side, the traffic will work just fine, but for the remote side, we're missing PIM all, you know, all the way in the path. So what will happen here, and a common example or a scenario of this is, I have multicast works only on some APs, uh, but there are other APs where it never works. So it always works on this set of APs, maybe on this building or on this floor, but it doesn't work on the other floor or on the other building. And 99% of the times is because you're missing some multicast configuration on the wired network, which is not, which is preventing the multicast traffic from the controller to hit all the APs in your network. So that's why this is so important. That's important to, that you understand what's happening under the hood. Okay. So as I say, to carry multicast traffic between the WLC management and the APs management, we will need PIM on all the interfaces in the network path between the controllers and the APs. So if you enable PIM on all those interfaces that are on those red dots, then whatever traffic, whatever multicast traffic that the controller sends to the group, the APs will receive, okay? So how do we do it then? On the core switch, we will have to also enable uh, PIM on the VLAN A or that layer three interface going towards the router. Then on, the, on both routers, we need to enable PIM on both of the interfaces and multicast globally. And on the remote side switch, we will enable PIM on the access point VLAN and of the uplink towards the router. Okay. So when we when we when when we have all that multicast uh, configure or enable in the path, in this scenario, we have one more thing to take into account. So what happens now? The clients will join uh, to receive the traffic that is being uh, sent from the server, right? So the controller knows that the clients 
want to receive that server. And if the controller is receiving that traffic, it will be able to carry that traffic towards the APs. However, is the controller receiving the multicast traffic? Remember, the controller will ask for the traffic on behalf of the client. So in this scenario, we also need to make sure and, and we need to ensure that the multicast traffic that the controller needs to send to the clients is actually received by the by the controller. Okay, so if we don't enable PIM on the interface where the server or the multicast source is, then the controller will not receive that traffic. Okay, and I'll go step by step in the next slides, so you'll see why or, or where will it break. Okay, but it's important that you know that the controller needs to receive the multicast traffic. If, it, if you don't have PIM on that uh, red dot that I'm enabling right now on VLAN C, what will happen is that the clients will, will join the group but will never receive any traffic because the remote side switch will never send it towards the controller. Okay? So now that we know multicast is configured everywhere where it's needed, we will assume that for the, for the example. And that basically means it's enabled on all those spread points uh, across the network. We'll go step by step on what happens, okay? So this server is sending multicast traffic to that group, 12.12.12. .12 so because no one has asked for the traffic, the traffic will be dropped at the switch, okay? So let's say we have clients on these two WLANs. Uh, we have clients on VLAN 50 and VLAN 70, which are WLAN 1 and WLAN 3 asking for the traffic. So they will send an IGMP join to, to the APs. Okay, the APs will receive that, that IGMP membership report and will send it in unicast towards the controller. Now, because the controller has IGMP snooping, it knows that there are clients on VLAN 50 and VLAN 70 that need that traffic. So the controller will create a, something that is called MDID, it's a multicast group ID, for each combination of VLAN and SSIDs, okay? So what will happen here is, let's say, in this case, there are two SSIDs and there are two VLANs, so the controller will create two multicast groups. When you have interfaces group, you have multiple VLANs on the, on the same SSID. So if you have that multicast group, there is an optimization that can be done, and I'll cover it later on, but it's basically this multicast VLAN feature. And what it will do is that, the controller will only send one request instead of two. And you'll see how, it's, how this applies to the optimization later on. So coming back to our scenario, we have clients on VLAN 50 and VLAN 70 that are requesting the traffic. The access point sends the traffic to the controller. So the controller now needs to ask, to ask for the traffic because if the controller is not receiving the multicast traffic, it will have no, nothing to send to the client. So the controller will send an IGMP join for that group on VLAN 50 and VLAN 70 to the core switch. Now, the core switch knows that IGMP snooping is enabled, so it will say, if I receive any traffic for that group, I know I have to send it towards the controller port on VLAN 50 and on VLAN 70. And the command to verify that is show IP IGMP snooping groups. Also, because the switch is also running PIM on, on the interfaces, uh, it knows that it has to ask its neighbors uh, for, for that multicast traffic, okay? So it will basically send a, a PIM join to the neighbor saying, hey, can you send me any traffic you receive for this, for this uh, group? And at that point on those neighbors, you'll see during the demo, this will create an entry on the, on the, on the multicast routing table on the show IPM route, which Stefania will explain later on. But basically the switch will request any traffic for that group because it has someone who is interested. In this case, it's the controller on behalf of the client. Then the router will ask its neighbors as well for that specific group. And the, 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 the next neighbor will do the same with the switch. So when the, the request gets to the switch, the switch is running PIM, and then it says, okay, I have some traffic which I'm, I'm receiving from VLAN Z, and then uh, here it is, and it will start sending upstream. What will happen if we didn't enable multicast on VLAN C, as I told you at the end of the uh, multicast uh, requirements, then this this part will never happen. The traffic will, will stay on VLAN C and will never go out of VLAN C. Therefore, the controller will never receive the, 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 the multicast traffic from the server. Because we enabled multicast on all the interfaces in the past, now the traffic is sent to the upstream switch. 
So this switch will update on the show IP M route. You will see that it update, updates something that is called the outgoing interfaces list for that specific group saying, okay, I have someone interested on my interface Giga 00 for that specific group. So that will be part of my outgoing interfaces list. If I receive any traffic for that group, I'll send it over that interface. This router does the same thing. And then the traffic hits the core switch, okay? And the core switch says, okay, my outgoing interfaces list for that group are VLANs 50 and VLAN 70. And you can verify that using show IPM route. However, because it, it has a layer to domain, VLAN 50, yeah. VLAN 70, the switch will also check if it's IGMP snoop table, and it says, okay, for VLAN 50 and VLAN 70, I will only send this traffic towards the controller. Even if I have another client connected to, to the switch on any of those ports, that traffic will only go out through the controller port because that's where I have received an IGMP membership report or IGMP joint. Okay? So, Basically, the switch will send two copies of the multicast packet, one for each MGID, basically one for each VLAN. And then the controller will receive that packet and will send that a copy of that multicast frame, uh, of that multicast packet for, with its source, its management interface and destination, the multicast group that you configure on the controller. Okay, so all that we cover so far was just for the controller to receive the traffic that it needs to forward to the clients, okay? So because we have, we are all receiving the traffic right now and we know which clients uh, need that traffic on which VLANs, we'll send that uh, packet with the source address of the controller management VLAN and destination, the multicast group, encapsulating the original packet, okay? That packet will, will hit the, the core switch on VLAN 20, it, that line should actually have been pink because it's sent over the controller management interface, and then we'll hit the core switch on VLAN 20, and, and the, the switch will check its outgoing interface list and will send it over VLAN A and VLAN 30. And the reason it's, it's going to VLAN A as well is because the AP sent the IGMP join asking for that group. So all those routers in the path, they ask, if they, if they have any traffic for 239.1.1.1, send it over to me. So those interfaces are part, are part of the outgoing interfaces list. Okay, so the traffic will be sent to both neighbors. Then the switch will check its outgoing interfaces list. And then this router will also check the outgoing interfaces list. We'll get to the remote side switch, which says that the traffic should go out of VLAN 30 and will only send it to the port where there are access points connected. Okay, so at this point, we have all the two-way direction traffic. We have the multicast traffic going to the controller and then that multicast traffic being encapsulated towards the APs, okay? So at this point, the APs will remove the multicast header, the CAPWAP header, and send the original frame who looks like, which looks like this uh, to the end, end clients, okay? So I know it looks like a lot. Uh, there are a lot of concepts going on and there is a lot of back and forth on this, uh, on this design, but this is, this, the idea of this is that you understand what are the requirements and what are the considerations you need to take into account when you're enabling wireless uh, uh, multicast in the wireless LAN controller. As you can see, it's just a checkbox and an IP address that you configure. But under the hood, this is, these are all the things that happen. So you need to take into account that the multicast configuration of your wired network is as important or even more important than the configuration on the wireless LAN controller. Okay, so if you have any questions specific to this scenario, please add them to the Q&A and make sure you specify that this is for the scenario number two. And with this, I would like to move to the next polling question. And it's about the slide we just talked about. So did you know the importance of the multicast configuration or your wire network before this session? Do you know it was really important to have multicast configured properly on the wire network for it to work when we were talking about wireless multicast? Uh, please uh, go ahead and answer the question. So, oh, hi, just real. Uh, I just sent out like the details from the last question. I don't know if you would like to share some comments. Sure. So, yeah, I'm seeing. So, the question was if you're using wireless on your WLC, correct? So, we have 22% uh, of the audience. It's 
it's using it. 32% is not. And the other 46% is not did not answer the question. So it looks like majority of people is, are not using uh, multicast uh, on the on the wireless network right now. But I hope with this uh, session you you get the tools to understand what are the requirements when you go ahead and try to to deploy multicast, and that you understand that if you have a team that does not only handle wireless, but that you have a separate team that handles the wired network configuration, then you need to work together in order to make sure that the wireless, uh, uh, the multicast traffic is carried between the controller management uh, billing and the access point management billing. So please answer the question if you know the importance of the multicast configuration on the wireless network before, on the wireless network before this session. In the meantime, we will move forward uh, to the next to the next part, which will be a demo that uh, Stefania will help me cover. So, uh, Stefania, all your yes, hello, thank you, thank you, Josbel. So, um, well, this is basically our uh, setup here. This is a very small network, so we will use PIMS PIM Dems mode. Uh, what we have here is basically uh, one controller. This is a 3504. We have a switch here. So we have a configured uh, trunk to the switch. We also have uh, attached to the switch an access point 2800. We have our multicast server, which is uh, also attached to that same switch. Um, but uh, you have to realize that uh, they are on different uh, subnets. The access point subnet uh, or VLAN is 2688. The controller management VLAN is 2687. The, control, the uh, multicast server VLAN will be uh, 2690. And of course, we will have one SSID will, where we will be uh, testing this uh, multicast uh, feature, which will be uh, the SSID uh, WLAN 1 which will be uh, placing the, uh, the client on VLAN 2689. As you can see, uh, we have different, different VLANs for everything, one different for the controller, one for the access point, and one for the client and multicast server. So what we have here is in order uh, for these VLANs to uh, talk uh, multicast, we will have our router. So this is uh, basically, um, with uh, sub interfaces. So we, we have one for each VLAN. Um, they are uh, very easy to, um, to check. Well, here are some like uh, code color to uh, understand a bit what is uh, this uh, network about. As you may uh, see um, here on the trunk port where the controller and the, uh, and the switch are connected, we don't have the VLAN of the multicast server. So what we need is that the uh, multicast uh, <clears throat> VLAN and the controller uh, VLANs uh, have uh, communication using uh, the multicast routing. Okay, so um, I will start um, sharing my screen. So you can um, follow me through these steps. So, so then, uh just to add yep. a little bit on the, on the lab description while you, while you start sharing, uh, Stefania. So this is actually a, a similar scenario than the second one we described, where the multicast server is not on the same, uh, on the same trunk than the controller. So the controller does not have a dynamic interface where the multicast source is, okay? So, so, so people relate to the scenarios we talked about. Okay, thank you, Jezebel. Okay, so here we have our um, controller. This is a 3504. As you will see, we have um, multicast disabled here. There is no multicast enabled, and also we don't have uh, multicast multicast. In this scenario, we will use um, AP multicast mode as multicast, so we will need to create our uh, multicast group with the access points. And then um, our server will be a server placed in VLAN 2690. Uh, um, this is going to be our server. We will be using um, this uh, multicast group to send the traffic to the clients that will request for it, okay? 
Okay, let's uh, start sending the multicast traffic to this uh, multicast group now that we don't have uh, any multicast enabled here on the controller. I will start this uh, multicast traffic and also I have here our client which is uh, connected to um, WLAN 1. So uh, WLAN 1 has uh, VLAN 2689. It is now connected, and uh, what we should do is just to start hearing the multicast traffic for the group 239.5.6.200, which is the one our multicast server is also configured. So let's just start hearing this traffic. And then um, let's go to our switch. So I'm sorry for that. Okay, so um, let's see what we have here on the switch. Um, okay, so um, the show IP IGMP uh, snooping group is going to display a per VLAN list of multicast groups that are attached per port. So here, um, even though we have a client connected to um, uh, VLAN 2689, we don't see uh, that it is asking for um, this traffic, the 239.5.6.200. Okay, so um, what we should do right now is to um, start by enabling multicast on our controller. We can do that uh, via GUI or via CLI. Via GUI is a very, very easy thing to do. As uh, just will mention, we just need to um, tick these two options. The first one is to uh, enable the controller to uh, start talking multicast, and then let's uh, use IGMP snooping, okay? So as it is recommended. So now I will apply this change. And since we will use uh, multicast, multicast mode, I will change uh, this option to multicast, and let's set our um, multicast group. In this case, I will use uh, the multicast group 239.2.2.19. So, um, well, we will have to apply this change too. And then um, we can go again to our switch and check uh, the port where uh, our access point is connected. And here, um, what we see is that uh, on VLAN 2688, we uh, we have um, someone asking for this group, okay? So our uh, access point is connected to this port and is asking for this group, okay? So now that we have multicast enabled on the controller, we can see this, uh, this entry on our IGMP snooping table on the switch. Then uh, what we can do is go to the router. Remember that we haven't enabled any uh, multicast on the router. So uh, what we can do is to check if there's um, something that comes from the switch, if we can see here. So um, let's do a show IP IGMP. I'm oh, sorry. And in this case, let's uh, look for the group that we uh, enable for the controller and the access points, which is 239.2.2.19. Okay, so uh, um, we don't have anything here since, um, well, this uh, router has not heard uh, any requests since there are no router uh, and router ports. So uh, we can check the M router ports here by using show IP, IGMP, snooping, oh, sorry. So, <clears throat>
So uh, there are no M router ports because um, uh, an M router port, as uh, Joseph mentioned, is um, is essentially a port that the switch has discerned is connect to a multicast enabled router. And at this point, the router has not multicast enabled, at least for the um, AP VLAN. Okay. So um, what we should do then is to enable uh, multicast in the AP VLAN only. So um, so uh, if you remember on the um, on the network diagram, we have a sub interface for this access point. So um, let's go and see what is the current configuration of that uh, of that port. She's in gigabit 1.2688. So right now, uh, we are not using any multicast configuration. This router is uh, already uh, um, enabled with uh, multicast routing. So what we should do then is to enable a uh, PIM on this interface. Okay, since this is a small network, we will use IP uh, PIM uh, dense mode. So let's go. Okay, and now we can try and see if we have any membership for this one. And so as you may see uh, here, now we have a reporter. This IP is asking for this group, okay? This, if you uh, check here, on our controller, this is the IP address of our access point, 95.104. So um, right now, the access point is asking for this group. It's asking to be a member of this group. Let's check what we see on the multicast routing table. And now we have a, a star comma G uh, entry. So this means that uh, there's someone asking uh, for this uh, multicast traffic. So this uh, traffic should go to this interface, which is actually the interface of the access point. But we don't know where it, co it, it could uh, come. This is uh, the star means that uh, there is uh, no one right now that is uh, that is sending this kind of traffic. So um, remember that we have uh, only enable multicast on the access point VLAN. So uh, what we should do then is um, to enable um, the multicast in the double C management VLAN. Okay. So um, the multicast management VLAN would be in this case the 2687 which is a different interface here on the router. So let's go and check that one. This is our WC management interface. We don't have a PIM enabled here. So let's go ahead and enable multicast there. Again, we will use dense mode. And now um, we can run again our uh, multicast routing table and see what is happening with this uh, specific route. So now uh, we not only have uh, that we are uh, being asked for this uh, multicast group uh, traffic, but uh, we now have uh, the source where this uh, multicast traffic will come. If you uh, pay attention, this is and a specific IP address. This is the IP address of our wireless controller. Okay, so right now what we see here is that the incoming interface is the interface of the uh, wireless controller, and the outgoing interface will be the interface for the access points. So this means basically that uh, multicast is enabled between the controller and the access point. Okay, so uh, what uh, we should do then is uh, check on the switch and check the M router ports. Now, 
If you remember, 2687 is the VLAN of the controller, and 2688 is the VLAN of the access point. Now, what we know is that uh, Gigabit 102 is our M router port for these VLANs. Okay? This one is the VLAN of uh, our client. So, right now, it does not have any uh, multicast. Uh, enabled on that one. So then, even though we have uh, multicast enabled between access point and controller, we should uh, not be able to receive multicast traffic because we, we have not uh, yet the complete configuration for those ones. So uh, just let's check very uh, quickly the uh, MGID list. So what we see here is that <clears throat> our client is requesting this, this traffic. We can check the MGID details. This is the MAC address of our client connected to this access point. And it is asking, as, uh, as, as we saw, for this group address. Even though we can see this entry here, that does not mean that uh, we have multicast working right now. I can also show you, um, sorry. Um, that we are not receiving anything. We are sending constantly the AP jo uh, sorry, the IGMP joins, but uh, we are not receiving the multicast traffic that we are requesting to the server. So um, what rests here is to go ahead and enable multicast between the uh, client VLAN and the server VLAN. Okay, uh, let's go to the router. Um, the client VLAN is 2689, so um, let's go and check that one. Oh, oops. So this is our client interface on the router, and this will be our um, multicast server interface also on the router. We don't have PIM, PIM enabled on any of those uh, VLANs, so uh, let's go ahead and enable it for the client VLAN. Okay, and then let's look for the VLAN of, uh, sorry, the multicast group that we are requesting here. Oh, I think this is not the one, sorry. Okay, we just need some time. So um, again, uh, this is similar to uh, the one we saw with the access point. Uh, we see that uh, we are requesting for this for this traffic, multicast traffic uh, on this interface. But uh, right now, there is no one that is providing this uh, this multicast traffic as a source. So um, then, uh, what we can do is to enable then multicast on the uh, server side, and we should be able to um, have communication between these two VLANs. Um, just one thing I want to I want you to note is that our is is why we need to enable uh, multicast on our client VLAN. This is because we are receiving um, the multicast request uh, on the interface uh, of the controller. So this interface also belongs to the same VLAN as the client. So since the controller is um, is uh, is uh, handling this multicast traffic on, be on behalf of the client, we need that the client VLAN also uh, speaks uh, multicast. So um, now uh, I will enable multicast on the 
server side. So this is our um, server interface, as I mentioned before. So let's go ahead and configure That's him there. Cool. So while you do that, it's basically the, what is happening here is that if the controller will receive any traffic towards the APs, uh, if the controller will need to send some multicast traffic to the APs, it will be able to. But it's not able to receive the multicast traffic that the client are, are asking for. That's why you don't see anything on the on the end route. Is that correct, Nia? Yes, yes. So um, basically, we need here uh, to enable two multicast groups. One is the multicast group of the uh, service you want to uh, to to give to your wireless clients, and the other multicast group is is for the controller and access points. So this is uh, what you need. So even though you have uh, multicast enabled between uh, your client VLAN and your server VLAN, then if you don't have, uh, if you are using, for example, uh, AP multicast mode as multicast, if you don't have the multicast group for the access points and the controller set, then you won't be able to receive that multicast traffic. And the same goes uh, on the other uh, direction. So you need these two if you're using uh, AP multicast mode as multicast. Exactly. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, yeah, so we are here on the control on the sorry on the multicast server interface on the router. So um, let's go and enable PIM. And now um, let's check for the M road uh, of this uh, multicast traffic. So um, we have uh, here the Starcom IG as we had before, but now we are a new one, which is um, uh, this one as a source. So which, uh, which IP address is, is this? This is the IP address of our multicast server. So this means that now um, we are uh, receiving the multicast traffic uh, for this uh, multicast group from this, uh, from this source. This is our source, which actually uh, comes from uh, the VLAN of the um, multicast server. <clears throat> so then, then this uh, should be mainly what we need. Um, just let me check here. Okay. Okay, now we are uh, sending the traffic and Um, okay, I think we have disconnected. We are disconnected. I'm just reconnecting the client to WLAN number one. Now, since we already uh, configured multicast between access points and controller and between the client VLAN and the VLAN of the server, we are successfully receiving the multicast traffic from uh, the multicast server. This is our client and this is our server. We are uh, then uh, receiving this, the multicast traffic successfully. Just uh, want to make another check. Here, so uh, before we had this outgoing interface as null because it seems like our client just disconnected from the network. But once we reconnect it, we can see the complete output here. So <clears throat> basically, we are receiving the multicast traffic for this interface, which is the interface of the multicast server, and we are uh, sending this traffic to this uh, interface, which uh, is the multicast, uh, sorry, is the interface of the multicast of the client that is uh, asking for this multicast stream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefania, for, for sharing this demo with us.
All right. So thank you so much for everyone who has been here. I know many of you, you have to leave uh, just to attend something else. So for all of you who have not enough time to just uh, keep joining with us, uh, you can check out the recording just on the page where you register for this event in the upcoming days. Most likely it's going to be around there between uh, Wednesday or Thursday. So uh, you will be able to find it in the community there. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to read aloud some of the questions from, from the audience um, to Joswell and to Stefania. So, oh, sorry, here we go. So Joswell, uh, we have a question for you. So it says like this, uh, what happens to the multicast traffic if multicast mode is multicast and global multicast is disabled? Okay, so if global multicast is disabled, then the controller will receive the, the, any multicast request or, or anything that it receives, but it will not forward the packets to the APs. So the client will not receive the multicast traffic. So in order for multicast to work on the controller, you need to set the multicast mode and enable global, global multicast mode. Actually, when I say that for the 8540, for example, multicast unicast is not supported, is because if you have multicast set as unicast, multicast mode set as unicast, it will not even allow you to turn on global multicast mode. So in other words, or in short, multicast, global multicast uh, enables the actual multicast forwarding, whereas the multicast mode tells you how the forwarding is going to be done. All right. So once again, for all of you in the audience, if you have any extra questions, this is the moment where we are going to answer them. Uh, if not, you can just post them out on the ask me anything event of this session. So we get another question. Uh, it goes like this. Our Wi-Fi is dual stack. Any comments on MLD for IPv6? Yeah, so for IPv6, a little bit of a, another story. The forwarding logics from the APs to the, from the controller to the APs uh, is pretty much the same. We need multicast routing between the controller and the AP management villain. But well, yeah, so for MLD, I mean, for IPv6, we need to take another thing into account. We need to uh, cover, you know, router advertisement. We have something that's called router advertisement guard to prevent clients from becoming uh, multicast gateways, uh, the default gateway of the subnet, et cetera. So I, the logic of how multicast forwarding works is pretty much the same for IPv4 or IPv6. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, it, you know, MLD or, or IPv6 has some difference on, on, on the way the clients learn or, or request on multicast uh, traffic. And they also need, they have a different, different type of packets because you can leverage multicast to get IP addresses, et cetera. So there are some things that are specific for IPv6, but talking about the overall forwarding of the traffic is pretty much the same uh, logic than, than what you just saw here. Okay, so I have a couple of questions more. So one is, when does media stream make sense in being configured for multicast traffic? Yeah, so, so actually when you do media stream, you specify a, a, multicast, a multicast stream. Uh, and, and what it does is that you can combine that with multicast direct uh, to be able to actually send that traffic in unicast towards the APs for specific multicast groups. And, and that will allow you to to do some reliable sending and also, uh, you know, apply different policies because traffic would be would be in unicast. Awesome. I have another one here. It's how does directed multicast differ from video stream? Is the DMS enough to cover a multicast stream to unicast reliable packets going from the access point to the clients to avoid the packet loss issue? Yeah, so, I mean, the main difference is that uh, DMS is 802.11b, so the clients need to support 802.11b. And, and, and what it does is basically it, it, the access point catches the multicast packets that, were, that are sent for those clients to allow the clients to sleep for longer time, and, and then they will send the packet after the client uh, comes back up. Okay, whereas on, on multicast stream, we're just do, talking about the conversion from multicast to, to unicast. Okay, so it's kind of overlap. There is an overlap there, but uh, DMS is only for specific uh, client types who support 11B uh, in this case. And uh, it pretty much it's, it's for, mostly it's, it's used for, for 
uh, catching the, the multicast traffic on the access point, and then whenever the client wakes back up, then send the traffic to the client specifically. Okay, awesome. I have another one. It says, on the wireless line controller, uh, in the controller general page, what is access point multicast mode and multicast group address used for? So, um, as just well mentioned, the AP multicast mode is uh, used for the access points and controller to um, build a multicast group so they can uh, talk using this multicast group instead of unicast. Um, of course, the multicast group is the one that you set uh, for these uh, two devices, or well, will be they will be more than two devices, but uh, this uh, multicast group is the one that they will use to exchange these messages. So um, what we do with the multicast mode is instead of sending the multicast traffic to each access point using uh, unicast packets, is only uh, send the traffic using the multicast, uh, multicast packet, and then all the access points that are part of the, this uh, multicast group will receive it. That's mainly what it does. Awesome. Thank you very much, Estefania. And I have a last question just to, to complete this uh, live Q&A. If you have any other one, just please let us know. Well, alternatively, we can uh, post it on the on the forum session of this event. So the question it goes like this, uh, Estefania and Joshua. So if you have multiple sites connected via MPLS or DBBPN, and the access point at each site join the wireless line controller in a data center, if you have FlexConnect enabled to local switch, some of the VLANs you have to add the PIM comments on each side core switches for the required VLANs. Yeah, so so let me let me I'm gonna rephrase a little bit the question to make it clearer for everyone. The question is let's say we have multiple sites connected via either MPLS or DMVPN, and then we have APs on each side joining a, a, a WLAN controller which is centralized in a data center, okay? We're talking about a FlexConnect local switching deployment, okay? And the question is, do we have to add the pin commands on each side core switches for the required VLANs? And the question is, it depends, okay? So it depends on where is the source of the multicast traffic and what traffic are the clients interested on, okay? So in this case, the controller does not participate at all in the multicast forwarding. The traffic will never go through the controller, so you need to ensure that the, the, whoever is sending the multicast traffic that your client are interested in hearing, there is multicast forwarding between them, right? Because at the end of the day, the gateway of the client villain is the one who will receive the membership request from the client, okay? So you, you, you need that gateway to be able to receive the traffic from the, whatever the multicast source is and forward it to the clients. If you want all the sites to, re, to receive that multicast traffic, then you need to have multicast traffic probably con, uh, configured on all the sites, right? But maybe you have only, uh, if you're using FlexConnect local switching, maybe you have some, some specific applications on, on specific sites. So you may not need to enable multicast in the one. So it really depends on where the multicast source is and who are the, uh, where are the receivers and you know what are the, the VLANs that, that take place there? So the main difference or the takeaway of this question is for flex on the local switching, the controller does not participate in multicast. So multicast is not supported for flex connect in the sense that the controller does not have any configuration related to multicast for flex connect. It is all managed by the wired uh, network configuration. Okay, thank you so much for rephrasing that question uh, and those comments and for providing an answer just well. So just to complete, I have a last question. It says, uh, what happens if you have two wireless LAN controllers with two multicast groups and a client roams between the two controllers? Yeah, so basically what will happen is, let, let's go back one step and ask, what happens when the client runs from one controller to the other, right? If it's a layer two roam, or a layer three wrong, right? Is the client gonna uh, do a completely new association on the, in the a new controller and the point of presence will be the new controller? If the point of presence will be the new controller, then this controller will send an IGMP join asking for that, that, that traffic, and then it will start forwarding it using the new multicast group for its APs, 
Okay. However, it's remember this is transparent for the client because the original multicast group or the application it's using is not going to change. What will change is how we're uh, the multicast group that we're using to send that traffic to the APs. Okay. Now, if the if the client is actually anchored, okay, then then there, that's when you when you need to take a look at the at the access at the point of presence of the APs. Who is receiving the multicast traffic? Okay. So in this case, the multicast traffic will be received by the anchor controller. And it's going to be sent through the mobility a tunnel to the controller where the access points are connected, and then that multicast group will be used to forward the traffic towards the, the, the access points. Okay, so basically, the, in short, the, the access points where the client is connected to are joining the group that is configured on their controller, and that's the IP address that they will use to receive the multicast traffic. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much. And what we're going to do right now is just closing this session. Thank you, everyone who has joined. Uh, from all the questions uh, that you have after this session, or if you have anything else that you would like to clarify, we have this Ask Me Anything uh, of this session. It's going to be available till this Friday. So for anything else, please feel free to post your question just right there. I will place a link on the chat so you can have access to, to this uh, Q&A session. And well, uh, we'd like to thank all of you. Uh, particular Stephanie and Joseph for taking the time for being with us today and sharing all your knowledge with us. Uh, thank you so much. We hope you have enjoyed this experience as well. Thank you, Hilda, for, for sure. Thank, thank for you, Hilda. And hope to see you again on, 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 on any other sessions for the Cisco community. <laughs> Yeah, let's look for that. Thank you very much. And well, uh, for all of you, if you would like to find any further events like this or any other information or activities that we have in the community, please feel free to visit us on, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on the different social media channels that we have, so as YouTube, um, LinkedIn, and also in the application for all those customers and partners that have it on their mobile devices. I uh, also would like to know if you are looking for Fortnite training or anything extra in a different local language. If you speak another different rather than English, you can find events like this or any other session similar to this one in French, in Spanish, in Chinese, Japanese, or Russian as well. So feel free to just have a look to them. And well, for all of you who are developing a career in IT, uh, the Cisco Learning Network keep offering lots of trainings and webinars like the one you are watching right now. So if you want to check out more, just please have a look to everything they have on the, on the Cisco Learning Network. So I'm going to place a link on the chat so you have a look as well to that. All right? And well, finally, and just to complete this, uh, we'd like to thank you for your time. Your opinion is really important for us, and it helps us to improve a lot. So please help us to fill out this survey and let us know how we are doing, how can we improve, and also what kind of topics we would like to see in further and upcoming events. We take that into consideration, and that's how we provide the sessions to you. And finally, for all of you who have been on this session and have been bearing with us for a longer time, you are able to participate and earn a 35% discount in any Cisco press title that you wish. The only thing you have to do is just fill out the, the survey that is just appeared right there. And without filling the survey, you can redeem the 35% discount by being on this session. So I'm going to place the details of the chat and the code so you have access to that as well. And once again, thank you so much. Remember that the recording of this session is going to be available in the upcoming days. It's just the page where you register today. All right. So thank you so much once again. We wish you have an excellent day. And thank you so much. Just when you are in Europe, so good evening right there. And thank you so much, Stefania, on America with us as well. And we wish to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Hilda and Jasbel. And to all of you. Thank you. So see you on the next session. <laughs>